All right, this morning, we have a really tall mic. I'm not going to touch that one. Um, we have a speaker who has the height that I wish I had. How's that? <laughs> um, so we'll just, I'm just going to look underneath the mic. How's that? And uh, we'll go from there. This morning, if you look through your bulletins, you'll notice that there were a couple things that weren't included in the bulletin that normally are. And one of them is the offering, and the other one is the announcements. That's my oops. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to make sure you check your bulletins and read through them. There are many announcements, and the pace of the Christmas season is starting to pick up. Uh, maybe not as busy as it was prior to COVID, but we are definitely in a space where we have this feeling of momentum and motion. So um, please check your bulletins. We have a number of events that are coming up. Um, one of them being a meeting that is scheduled for December the 7th. So please pay attention to that. Um, once you folks get a chance, please check your mailboxes. Um, there are letters in your mailbox from David on behalf of council. And so that it's an important read. But if you get email, you would have also received that announcement. Um, I'd like you to take a look around you. And if you'll notice, we've got some nicely decorated interior. And that was thank you to Ermgard and to Marcia. So it looks wonderful. This morning, we also have an announcement from David. It's uh, great to see everybody this morning. And, uh, you know, we do so. We come together and uh, pray for small and large miracles, don't we? During a time like this. And uh, I did want to share something in terms of encouragement, and then I want to make a special announcement. The encouragement was um, during this time of rain, during this time of rain, it was very special to go and help a dear friend, Randy Redekop, among 25 other people. And I know he's coordinated hard the last many days, week, trying to clean up different properties and work at, uh, you know, a, a challenging situation. And Randy looked across the field and showed me the place where they they saw a green field, and then a matter of a day later was so many feet that they could go in a boat from a nearby property and not even hit the fence. And then to show me where that water line had been on the side of the barn. And then coming together yesterday, among other times, to start cleaning up with the expectation with the confidence that things will be better. It's not easy, but you know what? It was really, it, it felt so great to be, able to be able to do something, right? Because all those people had these different stories about how they got involved. One person said they were a friend of a friend of a friend. Another person said they'd known um, the family for decades. And there's another person who said, you know, I'm a student at Columbia Bible College. And they just wanted to come and help. So it was very, very good to work with our hands as a sign of love. And it was very, very good for the soul. So I just wanted to share you that encouragement because um, it's important. So continue your prayers and your support in so many ways. It's making a huge difference. In fact, I, um, I'm going to quote someone. I won't say their name, but they were a very senior person in, of administration, like very high administration at CBC, who said, you know, I've never felt closer to this community, this value, valley, and I grew up here. And it's been remarkable, the kind of stories and connections and, and miracles I've seen. So amen to that. So I wanted to share that with you this morning. I also want to share with you an announcement from a leader named Laura Lowen. Does anyone know Laura Lowen? Laura, how long have you been 
serving as a seniors coordinator at Emmanuel Mennonite Church since 2011. And Laura has made, in the name of Christ, a great impact, a great difference in people's lives. Has she not? She sure has. So Laura this Thursday gave me a call and said, you know, I, I can't get through your spam filter, but I can get you by phone. <laughs> you know how these spam filters work. But Laura shared with me her decision to resign her role and uh, to make that kind of transition that happens. And Laura, we just want to thank you on behalf of the congregation. Um, Laura's last day is... December 31. However, given um, the desire to have a, a break, it will technically be December uh, 17. And I want to share with you the letter I wrote back to Laura on our behalf. Thank you for your letter of resignation this Thursday and your phone call. Laura, I very much appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you your decision and reflection on your ministry at Emmanuel working with our seniors community. You have also been and continue to be involved in so many aspects and people across our congregation. On behalf of all of us, thank you so much, Laura, for all your leadership and for sharing your many gifts with our congregation in so many contexts and people's lives and sharing God's love with us. That is, a trans that is transformative as you walk with so many people, particularly our seniors during many good and many challenging times in their faith journey. I go on to say, um, again, thank you, Laura, and blessings to you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, David. Um, with that, we're going to transition into the part of worship that we usually start with. And I have one, just a change in the bulletin. Um, the Redekop brothers, Carter and Call Callahan, are not with us this morning. I am not sure if you are aware, but um, John is not doing well, and the family is with him at this point. So please keep them in your prayers as well. Um, but I will be becoming the Carter boys for those pieces. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to stand and turn in your hymnals to song number 215. 215, Oh, How Shall I Receive Thee?
All right, Ooh, Advent, um, one of my favorite times of year. It's a time when I feel the closest to God. I always look at the Advent season as the beginning of the year. I don't see it as the end of the year or at school. We always saw it as that marker that we made it to the middle half of the year. Um, but for me, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of a story uh, that gives us hope. And that hope story is so important. Um, without hope, we don't have that sense of fulfillment. We don't have a sense of peace. And we surely have a very unsettled feeling about where things are going. So when we come to this Advent season, I always like to spend time and um, Christmas music runs through my household probably earlier than it should, but there is just that sense of connecting our emotions and our spirit with the words that God has promised us. So this morning, we are lighting the first candle of Advent, and we just want to remember throughout the day and, and the coming days that this is that peace that God has given us, the hope, the hope for the future, the hope for things to come, the hope for uh, settling of things like peace and hope for goodwill and hope for reconciliation. There are so many things in context that we can put hope into, um, and only those things happen when God is at our center. At this point, I'm going to ask that we read the litany together. Um, I will do that um, just after I light the candle, and then after that, our music team will lead us in a song, yeah. All right, we light a candle of hope and we imagine. We light the candle to see God's goodness in us. Our Advent season has a couple of theme songs to it, so please stand, turn to number 211. Our Advent season has a couple of theme songs, and this is one of them that we will sing as we light our candles progressively through the Christmas season, or the Advent season. But today, we will only sing verse one. By the time we get to Christmas, we'll have sung the whole song. So is gonna play through it once, and then we'll sing verse one together. Good morning. Um, I'd like to invite all the children to come forward. It's quite a few today. Hi guys, I'm Lara. Um, today, on First Advent, we're talking about hope uh, and imagining God's goodness. Come on in here, you guys, if you want. You can sit in the front. One of the things that always strikes me about kids is how well they're able to imagine. Imagination is such a gift for you guys. It's a bit harder for adults sometimes. Um, are you guys good at imagining? Do you think you're good at that? 
Yeah. You ever make up stuff in your head, like make up stories and play them out? Or like have dreams at nighttime that's like imagining while you're sleeping? Do you guys have a favorite superhero? Anyone you like superheroes around here? Yeah, who do you like? Shazam. Anyone else? Casey? Wonder Woman. I like her too. Black Panther. Black Panther. Hulk. Great. Yes. Thor. Thor. Yes. <laughs> Lots. Black Panther. Yes. Good. <laughs> Okay, okay, there's lots. We like them all. Okay. So what makes that superhero great? Like we think of all the different things that make superheroes great. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, God is our superhero, and God's special abilities are unending love, fairness, goodness. In a minute. Um, and today we're imagining that as a robe, Okay. So I've got something here I want to show you. Okay, do you want to put it up, Wolf? So this is, so put this one up first. Okay, we practiced this. Okay, so this is an image of God. Okay, and we're going to put his robe on. So I need your guys' help decorating this robe. Okay. So let's tilt it a bit. You want to hold this? I'm going to bring it down here closer to the tip. Okay. So. Oh, okay, show them, show them how to do this. So I need you guys' help. So if you want to come over here and grab some of the things that we've cut out. <laughs> We're going to decorate God's robe here. Where's it going? Yeah, I think it's there. Good job. That's like a sash. We'll show it to the camera when we're done. I know this is obstructed here. Yeah, and these are all symbols of God's love and his goodness. Do something too? Yeah. Yeah? Let's put this one on somewhere. Nice. Do you want to give some you wanna give a piece to Gemma? There. There's some left there. Yeah. Wanna hand some to Gemma here? There you go. Okay, grab that little piece there. Good. Thanks, everyone, for helping. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, not that one. Goo goo gaga. <laughs> okay, so here's our little image see, of God and his robe of goodness. There we go. Thanks for helping me with that, you guys. Just <laughs> so I'm just going to pray with you before you go to Children's Church, okay? Can you fold your hands? Okay. God, thank you for these children and their amazing imaginations. Thank you for your goodness. And in this season of hope, we think of you and all of your superpowers. Amen. I want that. Say bye. Bye. <laughs> It's always fun to watch the kids and the enthusiasm they have um, for the stories that we know and uh, we want to be just as excited about those stories as they are. Today's scripture is found in two places. Uh, the first is in Psalm 25 verses 1 through 10. In you, O Lord, in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you not. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. 
Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore the instructs, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. The second reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 14 through 16. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both the sealed and the unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in clay jars so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. After I have given the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord. morning. Great to be here today. I'm Casey Sass. Um, I'm married to the lady who did the children's feature there for about 14 years. I've been a member here for the same amount of time. And uh, we're so uh, grateful to be raising our three boys here at Emmanuel. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I want to echo uh, what David said. Um, this past week is, was a long week. I was I, I teach out in Chilliwack, in East Chilliwack Elementary. It was a tiny school, and now it's uh, overflowing with portables as the eastern hillside is filled up. But um, I commuted through the Highway 7 all week, or to begin the week, and I ended up with a, a four-plus-hour commute, which I, apparently I was lucky. I heard some people had seven-hour commutes. So I got the privilege of uh, my, my folks live out there in, Ch in Chilliwack, so I stayed with them for a few nights, and I got the royal treatment. We got the... The crystal wine glasses filled with water and uh, the uh, French knives and steak and bacon and eggs for breakfast every day for my dad. So it was, that was a silver lining. I was also invited by multiple students, families, colleagues, families to stay with them and it just really made me feel seen and heard and, and so amidst this community coming together, that's a good thing and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today too. So hi Evan. Can we, dare we, embrace hope once more? Dare we to imagine God's goodness? While I researched the theme of hope for this sermon, the traditional first theme of Advent, I came across a beautiful catechism, which spoke, perhaps spoke to me as a boy who grew up in an Anglican church. When the church celebrates the liturgy of Advent each year, she makes present this ancient expectancy of the Messiah. For by sharing in the long preparation for the Savior's first coming, the faithful renew their ardent desire for his second coming. By celebrating the precursor's birth and martyrdom, the church unites herself to his desire. In the words of John the Baptist, he must in increase, but I must decrease. And I think that's a major key for us today. We must stand in truth. We need freedom. We need equality and equity that comes with it for all but we also need a shared language, a shared understanding and identity as a community to do so, so that our truth isn't just self-serving or just about us. And of course, we need this focus to be on God, on Jesus. But how do we send that message? More on that to come. Hey, I think I'm getting this preaching thing. Do we have Dietrich? There he is. Okay. Another quote that paves the way to seeing beyond ourselves is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the beloved and celebrated German pastor who was an early and outspoken opposer of the Nazi party in the 30s. And he was hanged weeks before the defeat of Nazi Germany in the 40s. 
Uh, Bonhoeffer said, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. Well, many of those in our own community have lost a lot of late. The floods, COVID, political divide, constant documenting and celebrating of self through social media, churches unwilling to stand with all marginalized populations, and to make their buildings welcoming safe spaces. Most of a generation, or perhaps half of two, the younger millennials and the older Gen Zers are conspicuously missing from our churches. Perhaps we are in a time of barrenness like in Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah was an oracle to the southern kingdom of Judah and he promised God's restoration after destruction and captivity at the hands of the Babylonians. Jeremiah 33, 14, 16 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, north and south. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. Back to Dietrich. Even a man of great faith like Bonhoeffer despaired and questioned his faith in his time of barrenness. He spoke of the complicitness of the German citizens in their consensual dictatorship, where even he, a man who spoke out against Nazism and was hanged for it, felt like his time of silence made him complicit. Struggling and questioning and wrestling with hope is a healthy human quality, a necessary one. Do we see this struggle as God working on us and in us? Are we hearing the Holy Spirit? Are we listening? Where does our focus go? Who do we give credit to? Do we cling to it as our own wisdom? Bonhoeffer said, we have been silent witnesses of evil deeds. Are we still of any use? He wrote fellow conspirators in December 42. With regard to the profound failures of his church under Nazism, he charged that it had fought only for its own self-preservation, thereby losing the very capacity to bring reconciliation and redemption to humankind and to the world. This sounds familiar to us today. Of course, Bonhoeffer's martyrdom inspired hope in many, Christian and humanist, humanist alike. And if you've been to Westminster Abbey, his statue is there. One biographer stated, there is arguably no other Christian thinker whose life and work has led so many people from such a wide range of contexts to claim him as their own. Even Christopher Hitchens loved him. We can see Bonhoeffer's dejection and grappling as perhaps honest self-evaluation, death to self, a humble desire to do more. He must become greater, I must become less. Another seeker of truth, is musician Sufjan Stevens, uh, worked through his own pain while finding hope in his song, The Only Thing, a song that I claim is the most important song in my life. It summarizes his faith in God in times of barrenness, and mine as I hear it, that despite my depression, the natural disasters, the plagues, the revelations of abuse and neglect in our residential schools, the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, to name a few, the image this week of Kyle Rittenhouse shaking hands with Donald Trump and smiling smugly. The rise in power of autocrats and theocrats around, theocrats around the globe. And the shame, shameless accumulation of wealth amidst poverty and pandemic. The seemingly infinite sadness, destruction and despair in our world. We as the church hold on to faith in a loving God that redeems that graciously loves and sacrifices for and longs for relationship with his people. Evans, Sufyan speaks of a indescribable sorrow inexplicably intermingled with hope as he deals with the death of his mother. And it's heavy. He even questions God and considers self-harm as an escape. I won't sing today, but. <laughs> the only thing that keeps me from cutting my arm Cross hatch, warm bath, holiday in after dark. Signs and wonders, water stain writing the wall. Daniel's message, blood of the moon on us all. Stephen sees God's beauty. 
even in the banal or decayed elements, the water stain writing the wall as a beautiful sign and wonder. How can he, how can we vacillate between wanting to end our lives and find such, and finding such divine beauty in, in his and our world? Why do I? How can our lens change so much? Is it the spirit working in us? Grappling against my base selfishness and my sin, my inability to see or trust, is he bringing me the hope? Bufyan makes his faith statement even clearer in his final verse. The only reason why I continue at all, faith and reason, I wasted my life playing dumb. Signs and wonders, sea lion caves in the dark, blind faith, God's grace, nothing else left to impart. Sufyan is speaking to blind faith, faith without reasoning or justification or apologetics, faith that is based on God's grace, the beauty that he has given us in the natural world, and ultimately Christ coming to earth and dying for us. It gives us continual hope as we await the second coming of our Savior. Psalm 25, 1-10 speaks of God's hesed love, the Hebrew for steadfast love. I'll read it again here. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truths and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. I love that. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old, from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. What a promise. So the Hesed love, a Hebrew for steadfast love. We can dare to hope our Savior has come and will come. Whether we cling to this with blind faith or intense introspection or through the study of many narratives, perhaps all three. During our communion and congregational sharing time, I'd love to hear from many of you. How have we as a congregation experienced God's steadfast, steadfast or hesed love? How are we finding hope as a congregation? Are we clinging to God's promise of righteousness? The branch of David seems particularly apt, a particularly apt metaphor during these flood times with our atmospheric rivers and such. We need Jesus as a limb to hold on to. All right, first, first, first Thessalonians 3, verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Good God increases believers' love for one another and strengthens our hearts in holiness. If love and holiness include how we think, what we do and say, what we feel, what we believe, how are we accomplishing this as a church? How are we accomplishing this individually? Perhaps most importantly, we need to rely on grace here. I've been humbled many times as I attempt to take on jobs that require love and holiness. When a friend or colleague, a neighbor or family member is hurting, how are we responding? A desire to be an ally in action and word is great, but I'm learning that I can't just be a golden retriever. I mean, I'm a 300-pound, bald, bearded man. I need to discern. <laughs> I need to give time and space. I need to sit with and hold grief, to listen more than I talk, to help the hurts I see in my little world. I can't rush in and problem solve. I can't talk circles around the problem. Can we challenge our own ignorance? I'll bring up another failing of mine. A few days after Halloween, I had become sick of my young South Asian neighbors lighting off fireworks. Scares the crap out of my dog, Rufus. And we're trying to get our kids to bed, Jogi. 
I've known Jogi for a long time and we have a good relationship, but he's 18 now and I want to encourage and help guide his life. But maybe not when I'm trying to put Ivan to bed. I was ready to ask him to call it quits for the night when it suddenly clicked in my head. I remembered it was Diwali, celebration of light over darkness celebrated by South Asian Indians. I had to confront, confront my own ignorance. I was ready to tell someone else to stop their celebration on their religious holiday. Would I turn off my Christmas lights for an angry neighbor? Me and the boys had even been lighting dias. They had made dia cups in, in school to learn about another's culture for Diwali earlier in the week. And yet in my frustration, I forgot. We need to be careful to challenge our assumptions and be careful how we write our own past narratives into our current lives and to others' lives, especially into their pain. Do we read stories on our newsfeed because we agree with them and ignore the ones we disagree with? When we scroll Twitter and IG, what are we drawn to? How are we weaving hope into these daily routines? Whose point of view are we listening to? And a friendly rem not reminder, it's not the job of the minority or the marginalized to educate. We need to do the work to bridge the gap between our ignorance and our knowledge, and we need, again, to rely on grace for this. So in every book and song and movie we consume, we make a choice with our money and our time. Can we listen? Can we seek to understand, to understand other perspectives and allow them to influence us? I was inspired by our church summer reading list, which was put together by Cindy Brandt, with many of our congregation's inputs. In it were a selection of diverse voices. I was so proud to see this list. What does First, First Thessalonians 3.12 say again? May the Lord make your life, in, make your love increase for each other and for everyone else. I was so proud to see this list and all the great titles we have in stock. So there's my plug for the library. Let's, <laughs> let's get in there and learn. Let's overcome our own ignorance. Take out a book by a black, indigenous, or Asian author. If the last few books you read have been by white men, take, take out a book by a female author. Let's invite equality and equity into the way we consume knowledge and train our brains. I am a teacher, by the way. We, we can immerse ourselves or at least occasionally examine other narratives and foster God's truths through new perspectives. But there are too many perspectives, you say, a little voice in our head. What if I lose myself? What if some of these perspectives are damaging to me? What if they contradict my beliefs? And these are some valid fears. Well, again, the church has carved out some great titles that build knowledge and perspective, but we may need to ask ourselves, can we remain closed, heavily guarded, and still have hope? If we push one narrative, one agenda, one subset of voices, can we be open? Can we fully serve? This is true across the board, by the way, from liberals to conservatives, left to right. How do we create community with shared language, connection, and understanding? We do it by honoring God, by attempting to overcome our ignorance. He must be greater. I must become less. New historical narratives and truths are unfolding around us. How does this fit in with God's judgment? We are reminded in Luke 21, 35 to 36, for it, that's Christ's second coming, will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Will our low and our faithful rise up in power? Can new equity, inclusion, truth, and reconciliation foster a future of hope? All right, I'd like to close with a beautiful poem written by a woman named Kathy Giesbricht, who lives in Manitoba and um, is involved in our worship resource. In the middle of a Canadian prairie winter, sitting each in our own space, separated, bound together by our threads of hope and longing, we placed ourselves in the ancient texts and waited. Would the incarnate God come and sing over us? Could we sing joy to the world? 
Slowly but surely, the spirit showed herself, comforting, wooing, assuring, revealing. The word came to life, living among us. Steadfast love began to hold us, strong winds of righteousness, and glory began to blow over us. The Lord our God was in our midst. A glimmer had arrived. Only now could we free our lament and speak of our struggle. Seeing the salvation of God, our despair could enter the light of day. Cracked open by tender mercy, the eyes of our hearts and minds caught a glimpse of what might be, what will be, we dared to imagine. The faces of John, Mary, and the boy Samuel urging us on. We opened ourselves to holy possibilities. Images, words, prayers, and even songs rose over us and among us. We received them. We recorded them. We slept with them. We shared them. We invited others to speak into them. We gave thanks to God. We now offer them to you, our siblings in faith. May the spirit of the living God free you to imagine. Amen. Thank you, Casey. You have given me great food for thought. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. And it's so appropriate that this song will follow this message that we've heard today, talking about signs and wonders. This is our theme song for the Advent season. So I invite you to turn to song number 276 in the Voices Together hymnal and stand. We will sing this song together. It will be new, but just uh, join in when you feel comfortable.
back to song number 239. take off my guitar because I have to move for this song because this song comes to us from Cameroon. It's a traditional song from there and it has that flavor to it. So we're going to sing through the whole song twice because we decided the song wasn't long enough. So give us our notes. <laughs> And we have communion. As I have been in the role of administrative pastor, it has allowed me to spend some time reading and as we encounter different events and occasions to revisit some of the readings that I have done in the past or that I have learned in the past. And communion is also one of those pieces. To go back and read through some of the Anabaptist history of where communion came from and where the practices separated differently from the Catholic Church and how we have moved forward in our participation of this event. Um, it was good for me to do that journey to remind us that this time is a time for us to reflect and it's a time for us to commune with God. It is a time to do that in community and to recognize the things that have happened in the past and to move forward when it comes to things like reconciliation and to make right our relationships, whether they are with each other or with our relationship with God. This is an invitation that we find in our hymnal, and I really enjoyed reading it and felt it was a good place for us to start. It says, Jesus was always the guest in the homes of Peter and Jairus, Martha and Mary, Joanna and Susanna. He was always the guest at the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the case of the poor. He was always the guest of unsettling polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger. He was always the guest, but here at this table, Jesus is the host. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to follow him must first be
be fed by him. Those who wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, you who are hungry and thirsty, for a deeper faith, for a fuller life, for a better world. Jesus Christ, who has sat our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. At the invitation of our Lord, we are at this table to remember. Before we start to take this meal, I'd like to take this time and opportunity for a time of sharing. It is something that's become very meaningful within our community, but it's a time where we can share memories, we can share celebrations, and we can celebrate sorrow. So I've asked Nate today to be our roving mic, and he's going to just come around, and if you have something you would like to share with us uh, before we start the communion and partake of the elements, this would be the time to do that. So if you just raise your hand or signal Nate somehow so that he knows you would like to share. Uh, I just wanted to thank Casey for the message this morning. I have to say that I could uh, resonate with a lot of those feelings, um, a lot of those struggles. And this last year, well, this last little, quite, quite a while, um, it's been full of struggles, I know, for everybody, hearing everybody's stories when we stop and talk to one another. Um, I guess one thing that strikes me is how, uh, even though it's been a dark time for many people. Uh, I'm thankful for God's faithfulness and being with us, even though we can't always necessarily um, feel it. Uh, I know last year I went through a time where it, you know, thank goodness it wasn't COVID, but I had a real asthma flare up, partly stress and things like that, but I, um, partly from a virus, but I ended up coughing three ribs out of place and tearing muscle. And it was such a, difficult time because I was bedridden for a month because of the pain and I was completely useless for everybody, my, my colleagues, my family and I felt like just a completely empty vessel. At the same time, of course, I crashed. I had, you know, um, a uh, you know, a complete burnout that came and I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still climbing out the end bits of that <laughs> um, but God has been gracious and, and being able to help me through at least the first half of this school year. And um, I'm starting to, you know, see the fog lift mm -hmm. and <laughs> that feels good. And I'm very thankful for, for my family, um, for being grac gracious with me and, and um, being supportive. And, and I think um, the humbling thing is being able to see that God still works through us even when we feel like we are completely empty. and. Uh, I was reminded of um, uh, one time my, my mother consoled me and said, you know, sometimes an amaryllis bulb that looks completely dead just needs to be put in the closet for a while. And when you take it out, it still looks like nothing much. But after a while, something glorious comes out of it. And so I, I you know, would um, just leave that with, with all of us, you know, if we can maybe... Some of us may be going through that <laughs> closet amaryllis time, <laughs> but know that God is still at work. There are still beautiful things yet to be seen. And I'm thankful for uh, the new pastors who have come to Emmanuel. I see a lot of wonderful things there, and I do see hope. So.
either we either have a very shy group of people or we have a lot of prayers and thoughts that are thoughts that we at this point want to just share with God and that's okay too. Just uh, reflecting on the theme of hope, and as most of you know, we, and you probably have heard her babbling, we had our daughter Clara one year ago. Uh, she just turned one. And uh, six weeks ago, my sister Rachel gave birth to her, Rachel and Mark gave birth to their son, Leo, Leo John. And um, yeah, that's just been a real, so it's just amazing how much hope children can bring in light of what Casey and Elaine have shared and there's been a lot for in everyone's lives and we've just been so thankful for our children and the ways that they yell during church when you know and talk and you have nothing you can really do about that and but but it's joyful and it's hopeful and i found the same in my role as a high school teacher teenagers they can be very dumb sometimes and they can you know and it feels like it's like what are you doing but the other but then you know, that's a little bit of it. But most of the time it feels like when I look at teenagers and children, you just see such hope and such, like, I don't know, I see, a, I see in most of them a lot of kindness and thoughtfulness. And sometimes you get, it's easy to get caught up in those little moments. You know, you see someone do something, and I, I find most of the time that that's not the case, that they, they really care about the world and they want it to be a better place. And that's my experience most of the time at work and now with our, our little kids. And, and yeah, that's, that's where I found a lot of hope in the last few years. If there's no one else, let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we come today to you to ask that you be with the family of John Redekop, the family of Marie Froze, the family of John and Leona Krauss, and Sharon and Manfred Rands, as these families are struggling with health issues. We lift all those other families that are up struggling in quietness of their homes and their hearts. We know that there are people that cannot physically participate today, and we just pray that their thoughts and prayers will be close to them and to you as we um, participate in communion. We want to recognize that there are signs of hope, the hope that we see in the birth of children, the hope that our children and our young people bring to us as they look to the world for, with enthusiasm and graciousness and mercy but they also see the potential in the world around them and lord we pray for those times when it feels so dark that we aren't so sure that we see that glimmering light at the end of the tunnel and yet we know that it's there we pray for those moments where um, as elaine said that the fog is lifting or when moses and his people saw the cloud lifting uh, when it was time to move on to continue the journey and we just know that you walk with us for all of those times and all of those pieces as we um, head into the communion part of our service lord we just ask that you would fill us with the holy spirit and just allow us to feel that presence um, as we participate we pray these things in jesus name amen Before we participate in communion, I would like to just go through a little bit about how we're going to do this again so that we keep our environments as safe as we can, but also to um, participate together. So we'll have uh, the two stations that are set up on, on your left and right. Um, we'll ask that you come up the left side or the right side, and then when you exit, you come back down through the center. I believe Jeff will be taking the trays upstairs so those people sitting upstairs don't have to come down the stairways 
um, so the communion pieces will be served there as well. Um, I would ask that you all um, take the elements back to your seats with you um, and wait so that we can partake together. It is an event that I really, for me, is very important that it's together um, and not taken in isolation. And so we just ask that you would wait and we'll check to make sure that nobody has been missed. Among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, do this in remembrance of me. Later, he took the cup of wine and he said, take this in remembrance of me. Christ, whom the universe could not contain, is present to us in the breaking of this bread. Christ, who redeemed us and called us by name, meets us in the sharing of this cup. So take this bread and this wine. His meal, God comes, this meal, God comes to us so that we may come to God. All right, um, deacons, you could serve. And while we're being served... Our music team will lead us with some singing, and you're welcome to join in, please. So if we start the rows on either side, please. If you would like to use your hymnal, we will begin with song number 467. It's a fairly simple song. You can just listen as you feel it.
has anybody been missed? So take this wine and this bread, this meal that God has come to us for, so that we may come to God. To close off our service, I invite you to stand and we will sing a song number 812, sent forth by God's blessing. Number 812. us to see all the opportunities to draw, to offer hope to others. Hope for the Indigenous people as we recognize the land we are on was once theirs, this land that we are grant, gathered on today being part of the Matsky First Nation, which was actually affiliated with the Stolo Nation, who are caretakers of this land. The hope that we have is that we can seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on honour and a deep respect so that we can work together to be good stewards of a land that you, Yahweh, have created for us. We have a hope for the healing of the nations from this COVID virus, the hope that there is for those who have left this physical world to be with you in your heavenly kingdom. We have a hope for peace, a peace that you can give individuals to families, communities, and countries. But most of all, we celebrate the hope of your resurrection. Yahweh, you are so gracious to us, even when we seem to lose hope. Help us to remain steadfast and sure as we go on this journey with you. As we start a new week, help us to provide hope to those who feel hopeless and to shine a light into their darkness. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Go with hope and peace.